options we have, but he doesn't predestine any one particular one always to happen. Now, he has the power to do that, and in some cases, uh, I'm sure he does. But um, anyway, we God, God is watching our lives and always has been. Okay? And, and where it says we're elected to be holy and blameless before him, that's what uh, the outcome uh, of us coming to, to be known by God and to be within his kingdom, we, will, we are considered holy and blameless. Okay? That was done before the foundation of the world. So whenever you read of God's elect, it's another way of referring to a Christ follower, basically. Someone surrendered to the lordship of Jesus. It's not some, you're not some, you're not, you're not, you're not elect because of how great you are. Because God's, God's had you in his plans from before the foundations of the earth. Can we grasp that completely? No. no. no that's, that's a bit of a mystery. We, we look through a glass darkly, right? But one day we'll see clearly and, and we'll understand how this, how this works. Um, these are the sectional thoughts for this morning on this slide. And uh, first of all, verses 5 through 6, we sort of got to start. Uh, we looked at 3 and 4 mostly last week. But th this morning we're really going to look at verses 5 and 6. Uh, the work of the Father in time past. We're going to sort of spend just another moment on this uh, early, the work of the Lord in the past. Uh, verses 7 through 12, the work of Christ at the cross in our lives. Um, basically, it's in the present of anyone who's going to hear the gospel and be saved. That's Christ at work in your present. And then we're going to look at the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And there's a sense of that uh, being not only in the present, but, but the work of the Holy Spirit in, into, into our future as well. And so that's sort of our goals today. So I um, just, just want to look at verse 5 and 6. Let me just read that. I'm going to pick up in love from the end of verse 4. But it says, In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. The beloved, of course, being Jesus, right? Okay, so looking back at verse 5, okay, so we're predestined to adoption of sons. We are predestined unto something, okay? In, in the New Testament, predestination is only applied to those who are saved, by the way. So in, in God's predestining work, God predestines elect believers unto something. Uh, for instance, unto eternal life with God. And never is predestination in Scripture applied to the lost, uh, to someone who's not saved. You're not predestined to go to hell. That's a decision you make. I've heard one pastor say, you go to hell. God is saying, you can only get to hell by stepping over the body of my dead son. It's the only way you can get there. Okay, and Consciously doing that. So, but, but that's a decision. Thus, God does not predestine anyone to hell. Every living person will have a genuine option to receive the truth placed before them and the opportunity to choose Christ or reject him. It's a free will it's a genuine choice. In Ephesians 2.10, we'll see soon that believers are also predestined unto good works. That when we're saved, we're, we're destined unto good works, which God uh, destined before the foundations of the world. So it's like we get saved, and, and part of our life of being saved is the Holy Spirit is in us, and it's moving us and suggesting and offer, offering opportunities for, for doing things that uh, expand the kingdom of God. Good works, right? So that's, his, that's the Father's destiny for us as chosen, that we would enjoy adoption as sons and daughters. And so his plan you know, is not just salvation and personal transformation, but also to be brought into a spiritual family of life with God. We see this word adoption. Now this is a word, again, that would have been very familiar to any audience there. Now it's interesting, in our, in our age we think of adoption almost always as children or or children and orphanages, but probably in Paul's day, in a big city like Ephesus, when you spoke of adoption, it had more to do with a slave being bought out of slavery into freedom, into his freedom. That, that probably would have been the main, the main idea. There were like uh, 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire uh, when Paul was taking the gospel, and this word adoption was more understood in that idea. The person adopted um, uh, received all the rights of a legitimate son in his new family. Now, usually someone would um, pay this fee to adopt you into their family. Maybe it's a family that never had a son, no sons at all. And, but they've had this slave who's just been faithful to the family and, and, and whatever, and they've decided we're going to adopt him, and you are now going to be as if you were my born son. All right? Um, that person received all the rights of a legitimate son in his family. In the eyes of the law, by the way, he was also an entirely new person. His old person 
cease to exist. That, that doesn't exist. You are now this person with this last name in this family. Okay? He was now a son or daughter in a new family with all the legal rights of any pre-existing sons or daughters. And that's huge. That's the word picture Paul is painting. Just that, uh, the, that spiritual truth in this way. So adoption means leaving one family and joining another. Leaving behind all that was involved in the first family and assuming the name, the characteristics, the resources, and the history of your new family. We all belonged initially to the family of a guy named Adam. That's sort of the family you're in. But through Christ, we're adopted into a new family. It's the family of Jesus Christ, okay? And God, his father. Um, now, we're, we're still tempted. Now, here's the truth. We're tempted to act out in our old family ways sometimes, aren't we? Don't we have an old saying, the old man dies hard. You know, when you get saved and you're talking about sanctification and living a holy life, the old man dies hard. That old, those old family connections, though legally gone, doesn't mean you instantly change, right? We're still tempted. But we've been transplanted into a new family, and now all our influences are new and positive and holy. Okay? And more than that, the emphasis is now upon living as a full-grown, mature, responsible son or daughter. You know, this picture isn't really the picture of an infant being adopted into a family that has no ability to make... The idea is an adult slave, imagine, being brought into the family, but he now comes into this. So as we come into it, generally, you know, we're, we're saved in an age of understanding. You know, that's... That, that's our belief, that's what scripture teaches. So we're, we're adopted into a family able to understand what's happening. Okay? But what's awesome is um, God doesn't mind sharing his name with us. He gives us his name at the outset, at the beginning. Okay? Even though we may not fully grasp everything, he still gives us his, his name. And this is because of the perfect work of Christ on the cross. You know, Paul explained it to the Jews who came to belief in Christ this way. In Galatians 4, uh, verses 4 and 5, it says this, But when the fullness of time had come, think, think of all of his Jewish history until Christ appears on the scene and is baptized by John the Baptist. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son to redeem those who were under the law. Okay, so only Jews were under the law. So understand Galatians. Galatians is written to Jewish Christians. That's the, that's the context of this whole book. But, um, but, 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 but to redeem, so he sent his son to redeem those who are under the law, the Jews, so that we might receive adoption as sons. So, even, so Paul even there is saying that the idea was you were being adopted out of uh, the family of the law, if you will, into the family of grace. And that's what he's trying to explain to the Jews. And they struggle mightily with letting go of their dependence on the law. We understand that. Romans, Paul expressed the same idea towards Gentiles. I think it's interesting, I love his analogy there, where he used the idea, the analogy of grafting an olive branch into an, a pre-existing olive tree. And the idea is the root of this great olive tree is Christ. There's Jewish branches that are becoming Christians. Uh, and then he took these wild Gentile branches, right? And he did this grafting procedure. And when you go through that thing, after a time, that branch is a solid and strong and receives its nutrition and, and, and sustenance just as much as an original branch from the root which is Christ. And so for us, this is the, that's the idea that kind of we're grafted in to this, this ancient root um, founded by God originally through Abraham, fulfilled in Christ, and we are now part of it. So all that to say in love, we've been predestined unto adoption as sons and daughters into God's family. And then the rest of verse 5 tells us how that happens. It says, according to the purpose, uh, your Bible may say, the good pleasure of God's will, of his will. It happens because God desires that it happen. Pretty crazy, okay? All of this plays out the way it does in each of our lives simply because it's God's will that it does. It pleases him. It, it's fulfilling of his purposes and design. It, it, it sort of it gave sort of Romans 8.28 uh, sort of a, a, a new, a, a good, it was fun to go back and look at that again, Romans 8.28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. That's what we just read in verse 5, okay? This is all according to his purpose, okay? 
And then what is the outcome? In verse 6, we get the outcome of this, and it's to the praise of his glorious grace uh, with which he has blessed us. Highly, uh, I was looking at the word, it can mean highly favored, okay? He has blessed us. We are highly favored in the beloved. That would be Jesus. So, again, we're in the part of this long, long sentence. It's still sort of talking about God the Father in my past, but this is the transition that we're going to leap into looking at now Christ in our present. But I just want to say this. His ultimate purpose is not primarily our redemption as such, but the praise of his name by his grace through our redemption. Our redemption is what, like what's called, someone getting saved is considered the greatest miracle in the universe. But the purpose of that is not so that we get to march around, oh, I'm saved, let's rejoice. So the point is, isn't God's grace glorious and isn't he worth our worship because of that? The, the redemption of mankind is for the, to the glory of God, you know? And I think sometimes churches play fast and loose with this truth in, in certain <clears throat> segments of Christianity where it <clears throat> dangerously makes us the focus of everything. Our wants and desires are to be the all, the be all and end all. I mean, homosexuality, gay marriage, loose sexual morality, health and wealth. We are the focus, and Christianity is to deliver our wants and needs, and that's the that's the, the end game, it seems. But that's backwards. God's glorious name through the work of Jesus Christ is to be the be all and end all in this church. But without question, God's blessed us in Jesus Christ. We, that, 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 we're, we're clearly to take that. And the word blessed here in verse 6, Greek word, karitu, uh, karitu. I doubt that's how you pronounce it in Greek, but that's how I'm saying it. And, and But it can be expressed as highly favored. I know, so I picked it up along the way. You guys know, most of the time, he asks me how I'm doing. I'm blessed and highly favored. Okay? Word of God says so, and I'm sticking with it. Okay? But the neat thing is the idea of being blessed or highly favored for God is irrespective of circumstance. Okay, you can be in a storm. That does not mean you've lost God's blessing and his favor. But, you know, but, but he's with you. Christ is with us in the storm. The Holy Spirit is strengthening us in the storm. And boy, that's a blessing. That's great favor to have that when life is hard. Okay? Moving on. So when the beloved refers to Jesus, introduces our next section, verses 7 through 12. Um, you know, I don't think we should, we should think that each person of the Godhead works independently because I think they all work together. They all work together. They're, they're a unity. Uh, they, they work together to make possible our salvation. But each person in the Godhead has a special ministry to perform, a, a, a special spiritual deposit to make in our lives. God the Father performs much of his work for us before all time while Christ works in our lives in real time. In real time. Let's just read verses 7 through 12. Follow along with me. Just try to get the big picture here at the beginning. Verse 7 begins, In him, Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Verse 11, in him, Christ, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purposes of, of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And finally, verse 12, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. There that is again. Okay, so verse 7. The work of Christ in our life. So in him, Christ, the beloved, the beloved, a bit of a shift in focus. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. A lot packed right in there. In verse 7, we have in two important things, redemption and forgiveness, both brought about by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. When we read redemption or redeemed, we are in this redeemed state because our sins have been forgiven. Redemption is, is speaking to the forgiveness of our sins. We are redeemed from our sinful state. There's no possible redemption outside of Jesus and his redeeming blood. Now, in Greek, the word for redemption always implies, again, the freedom of a slave bought by paying his ransom price. Okay? Now, before we were thinking about this idea of adoption, before the adoption can happen, there has to be the redemption of that man out of that state, okay? 
uh, to be brought uh, into the family. So this was the idea of, of buying the freedom of a slave. Uh, paying kidnappers as a ransom is probably not primarily the idea in view, although this word can mean that. Uh, but it uses the ancient Greek word apolytrosin, uh, which means to liberate or to set free upon receipt of a payment. To liberate or set free upon receipt of a payment sometimes uses the word a ransom. So here's the deal. Christ redeemed us. Christ did that for us. But Paul's not suggesting that, pay, that, that Jesus paid, for instance, a ransom to Satan or something. Uh, nothing got paid to Satan to set us free in this analogy. Okay? Um, <clears throat> but by his death and resurrection, Jesus met the holy demands of God's law. That's actually what we're bought out of the responsibility of our guilt and sin before a thrice holy God who at the end of days judges sin. Okay? And we can't buy our way out of that. And so everyone who doesn't know the name of Jesus is awaiting judgment because of that, 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 is, that, that weight that is over us. But Christ's death, his blood, was the payment that satisfied God the Father. There's often a word called propitiation, not just atonement, but propitiation is a really interesting word because it doesn't just mean that the judge, it's a picture of you being a court and you have this judge and he says, okay, you're, you're going to be hanged for your offenses and someone stands up and says, I want to I wanna take his place. I want to pay the price for him. So it'll be free. Now, if this is just a regular human judge, you'll go, well, okay, let us fulfill the requirements. Okay, you go, go hang that guy. Okay, whatever. But propitiation is a much more beautiful and deeper word, and Paul uses that elsewhere. But propitiation means not only is the judge satisfied, but your relationship, the relationship between the judge and you is made personal now. Okay? And so Christ's death not only satisfies our guilt, but it, it, it allows us to be in the presence of God the Father and for us to call him Abba Father now, okay? And so I love that idea that it's more than just paying a bill or paying a debt, but it's also the idea that God now looks upon us as a loving Father. So um, that wasn't in my notes, so that's for free, okay? Uh, propitiation, I didn't have it there. Anyway, but anyway, he's forgiven us. Um, this idea of forgiveness also comes from a, a Hebrew word to send away or to cancel a debt. Uh, I'm sure most of you understand the, 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 the thing that would happen, and I think it's in Leviticus and the laws are about the scapegoat, okay? That, that's sort of where this idea of being forgiven is. But your sin's taken away. One goat was sacrificed for, for his blood, but another goat, uh, the sins of Israel were put on the scapegoat, okay? And then he literally would be taken outside of the camp of Israel, out into the wilderness, and taken somewhere to where he'd be lost. I guess they had a really bad sense of direction or something. But anyway, you could go out and lose your scapegoat. I don't exactly know how that works. But, um, but the idea was he was carrying the sins of the nation, never to wander back into the camp. Okay? And so this idea of forgiveness derives from that idea that when, when Christ uh, puts, covers us with, with his blood, so to speak, um, that, that our sins are taken away. And, and David said it this way, our sins are cast as far as the east is from the west same idea. So that's what this idea of forgiveness is. Okay? His forgiveness to us sinners is an act of his grace. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. But knowing that we're forgiven makes it possible for us to fellowship with God, he with us, and enjoy his grace and seek to do his will. And that makes me want to praise and worship him. You know, very, it just naturally does. We have to be careful of just understanding that God's grace, the grace we have through Christ in forgiveness is not an excuse for sin. Not a, not a, not a free ticket to sin uncovered by grace. Rather, it should be an encouragement for obedience. It should be an encouragement to obey. It should be just the opposite. Because we have been forgiven, we can forgive others too, by the way. But here the ransom price is in part his blood. Showing that the blessings from the Father through the Son comes not only by divine decree, but also according to Christ's righteousness and holiness. That's why his blood had value. The sinless sacrifice. His sinless life, his moral example, or what give, give immense and sufficient value to his death on the cross, to his shed blood and broken body. A small point here, but we shouldn't, you know, 
take it some a superstitious or mystical view of the blood of Jesus. It was not Jesus' physical blood that saved anyone, but his real and total payment for the sins of man and the death of his whole person on the cross. The blood is a, a beautiful picture of that, but there's actually a totality of what happened on the cross. Um, there, there are those that would argue he didn't die by bleeding out, he died by asphyxiation. You can go through all the medical things on that. Okay, um, his blood's not so special that if we just uh, bled a couple of, if the blood mobile had pulled up and, and we'd taken a couple of pints off, then we could just sprinkle that freshest, sinless blood on people and they'd be eternally saved. No, it wasn't just the blood that was what God was looking for. It was vital to that. But just remember when, when, when a lamb, when, when the perfect blemish free lamb was brought to the altar for sacrifice. They, or, or even an ox or a great animal, you know, they, they didn't just bleed it and go, hey, we can use this guy next year, you know. I was watching Geographic a while back, and there's these there's tribes in different places in Africa that have like these big cows, and they have sacrifices where they need blood. But they don't kill that, that animal. They come out, they figure out how to just tap his jugular a little bit and get a big bowl of blood, and they heal it up, and they'll use him again next time. I mean, that wouldn't, that, that wouldn't, that wasn't what Christ, could, that would never have sufficed. That's not what the Jews did. What did the Jews do with the lamb? They didn't just take his blood, they killed him. It was his entire life wrapped up in the blood. Now, the word of God says that life is in the blood. I get that. But God also required the entire life and the body, and the body was put on the altar and sacrificed as well. So I just want to, I just, it's just good to remember there's a totality there. And yes, it is the blood, and, it, and it's not a wrong thing to, to say I'm saved by the blood. That's absolutely true. But it wasn't because blood had some magic, it was a magic potion or sin. It was because a sinless sacrifice went to the cross. And, and, um, and, and, and his life, his entire life was required to atone for our sin. At communion, we partake of the blood and the body of Christ, don't we? The blood and the body. And why is that? Because that's exactly what Jesus asked us to do. This is my body, broken for you. This is my blood, poured out for many. It's a unity. It's a unity. He gave it all. He gave it all. Okay? That was the ransom price for our redemption. So redemption is the result of state we get to live in because Christ's body and blood bought the eternal forgiveness of our sins. You know, the, the Old Testament temple sacrifices, they had to be repeated over and over and over again. Jesus finally, Jesus got us off the merry-go-round of that. Okay? One sacrifice, one time, for all time, for all mankind. That's how sufficient it is. Now, by grace, all our sins, past, present, and future, are covered by the blood of Christ, the, the sacrifice of Christ, but we're called to recognize our sin, confess it. James tells us that, that when we confess our sin, uh, Christ is faithful to forgive us of our sins. So he wants us to be in this process. Yet grace covers us, but, 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 but to be holy and blameless, to be blameless means to also say, Lord, I've sinned, and I need you to forgive me for that. Will you forgive me for that sin? That's how we stay blameless in God's eye. So redemption, forgiveness, through the work of Christ on the cross, verse 8, which he, and so, and so he does all of this. Everything I've described, I love this word, man. He lavishes it upon us. It's not for like, okay, a little bit. Man, we are lavished with God's grace. What a, what a Lord we serve, Okay. God, this lavish speaks of something extravagant, provided in abundance. And Paul can use this word lavish to express how we've been blessed by grace because of what we were just talking about. The grace lavished on us was a, obtained at great price. Great price, the life of our Savior. Grace is not cheap, it's lavish because of the cost. A, a great picture we find in John's Gospel of, of Mary Magdalene it's six days before Christ will be crucified. And he's at a dinner and she shows up with this bottle of nard, uh, we're told. And this is like hyper precious. And it basically uh, represented 10 months of salary for an average laborer in that day. It was probably her entire dowry. And the gist of that story is that she came to Jesus and no one had anointed him or anything and she takes her her dowry her bride price and poured it all upon him okay 
day, and he did his hair and anointed him, and he was so blessed by that. That was lavish. Judas just blows a gasket that she wasted all of that. Man, we could have fed so many hungry people with that. And Jesus just said, you don't even understand. You don't know I'm six days away from not even being here anymore. And you're calling this a waste? No, no way. It's awesome. She's basically anointing the sacrifice, the perfect lamb that will go to the cross. And, God, and Jesus recognized how lavish that was, and she's remembered for all time. But it gives us an idea of how, in the same way, we've been lavished, right? God's grace bought at a great price. You've probably heard admonitions against cheap grace, the attitude of sort of treating God's grace in our lives, flippantly sinning, just figuring, oh, well, I'm covered. Whatever, grace, past, present, and future. You know, that's, that's, that, that's making a mockery of this grace that cost Christ everything. You know, maybe it's just, you know, I'm a good person. I've got this deal with the, I've got this thing with the guy upstairs. I'm good. I don't need no Bible, no church, no people telling me what I'm doing wrong, whatever. You know, I'm, but I'm covered by Jesus, covered by the blood. You know, it's so easy to say that. That's cheap grace. You're taking something that, that was so precious, it was lavished on you, and making it, I don't know, sunscreen or something? I, I don't know, something just crazy. We're never to do that. It was, and on top of that, we received it as a gift. We're lavished with this as a gift. It cost us nothing. It's free to us. It's a lavish gift to us. So, man, to be saved by grace through faith alone and Christ alone, what a lavish gift. It was done in Christ's wisdom and insight. So the death of Christ was never an unforeseen incident. All of this was ordained by God before the foundations of the earth, you know. Um, verse 9, I've got to keep moving. Making known to us, now, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose. I think we're bouncing back, and some of, some of these pronouns are a little tough, but I think we're, we're looking at God the Father's will and purpose. Um, and then sometimes it's clearly referring to Jesus. But anyway, what Christ did made known to us the mystery of, of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. So I think those two his's are pointing to God the Father, who set this forth in his sons, Christ, uh, as a plan for the forgiveness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. I think just verses 9 and 10 just have to remind us that the betrayal, death, and resurrection of Christ to purchase the redemption and sanctification of all mankind has always been God's perfect plan. You know, it, 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 I'm not really going to get into it, but I, I, I'll just say this really quickly. Failure to understand that fully is really what led to the church creating anti-Semitism by blaming the Jews for something that should never have happened. That was really the birth of anti-Semitism. If you read the history of it, it began in the church. And um, actually, there were individuals that were very guilty, certainly the high priest, the Sanhedrin. I get that. But we, we ended up persecuting an entire people, right, for a millennium. And, um, and yet, what happened to Jesus was ordained by the Lord that it must happen. Jesus knew. When he left Galilee for the last time, he's going, it's time for me to go. So he set his face to Jerusalem knowing that it's sort of his time had come. So anyway, it was an exercise of his sovereign will. Um, anyway, God, God intended for one day a son to be led to a cross to die there for the sins of the world. By the way, that's the mystery referred to in verse 9, the mystery. Um, it was funny when we were going through, not funny, it was just inter interesting that when we were going through Isaiah, Isaiah was getting these hints, you know, sort of like, it was still kind of foggy, but the mirror was clearing, and, and he'd have these passages where he's sort of getting the idea that a Messiah is going to come, and boy, then we have Isaiah 53, wow, almost describing the crucifixion, crucifixion of Jesus, but what Paul is saying is that now the mystery, that mystery, always been the plan, wasn't God's purpose to reveal it clearly until now, and Paul is saying that mystery has been revealed, we, we now understand what God's plans and purposes are. Okay. 
By the way, you want to use that word mystery in scripture. It's not some eerie, creepy thing. It just means a sacred secret that God has a perfect timing for its revelation uh, in, in mankind, right? And what's cool is that now we're able to share that secret with the world, right? And then part of that secret it says here, God one day is going to unite the entire world in Christ. And certainly as we look at the book of Revelation, we, we see the sense of that. Ever since a sin came into the world, things have been falling apart, right? Sin tears everything apart, but in Christ, God is going to gather everything together in the culmination of the ages in, in Jesus Christ. And we're, we are a part of this great eternal program, and for us, it's no longer a mystery. Okay, verse 11, in him we have obtained an inheritance. Now, here's another word that would have helped people grasp a deep spiritual concept. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. <clears throat> I, I think when I see this, like, according to the counsel of his will, it could be God the Father, but you know what I was, uh, there, there, are, uh, there, there are some that believe that this, this is also means the entire Godhead. But when you talk about the counsel of God, it's, it's the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You know, they're, they're a unity when it comes to God's will. So back in verse 5, where we saw that through faith we're adopted into the family of God, thus ultimately heirs, eligible, now we're told, to receive an inheritance. And this inheritance being eternal life with God. I wanted to show 1 Peter 1, 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope, to an inheritance, that's my capitalization there, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Wow. Awesome. But we have been born again into an inheritance. Scripture teaches elsewhere that we're children. That when we're children of God, then we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and through Jesus, I, I have become an heir to the glorious kingdom of God and the riches of that kingdom. They're mine, and I, I am to be able to enjoy them eternally, not just in this short life. And this, predest, and this is predestined through God's foreknowledge. Verse 12 goes on, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In context, in Paul's lifetime, he and his readers were truly the first generation of believers. So that's what he's referring to in verse 12. Um, I, I think he's referring to more than just the Jews that were in Ephesus in this church, but the, the Jews and the Gentiles. But they were the first to hope in Christ. And, this, and again, and, and what is the value of that? Is it about us? No, it's to the praise and glory of God. There it is again. Honestly, man, considering the amazing things God the Father through Christ the Son has done for us from redemption to forgiveness of sins to adoption to inheritance. Man, we picked up a lot in a couple of verses. It's all been accomplished by the lavish, not just sufficient, but lavish gift of grace to us through belief on Christ. You know, is it really surprising that Paul expects that our natural response to all this should be praise to God? And that's an armful of stuff I just said, but there's an armful of, of truth we've just had shared with us that's, that's lavishly been given to us. That's a reason to praise his name. That's a reason to have great thanks in our heart. And this carries us into the, the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. He has a role as well. Verses 13 and 14 say, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. There's the, there it is again. It, it, that, that ended the work of each of the three parts of the Godhead. All, Paul ended it with that same thing. We have the entire process of salvation given in verse 13. How a sinner becomes a saint. And it's simple. It says, and I love this, it's personal. He says, we hear... Uh, our gospel of salvation. He says, you know, the gospel of your salvation is personal. Okay, the word of truth. Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again. We believe, and that's faith. We believe and that we hear our gospel. We believe that's faith. We believe in Christ. 
And it says after you've believed in Jesus, after you've trusted him, we, we, he, he goes one step further. He, he puts on you his seal of ownership. And that's the Holy Spirit. It's called, this, we're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. All of that, in fact, all of this this morning, I mean, even though before the foundation of the earth stuff, that one word comes to my heart, being a believer in Jesus Christ, security. Security. I don't know if I should say this, but I will. It's nothing bad, but I just said, in, in my life as a Christian, I've gone from the, I think you can, you know, can you lose your salvation or once saved, always saved, you know? And I gotta, I gotta, I gotta admit, I, I, as I've studied in the last couple of years, I finally shifted. I, I think God does things that, that once you make a true profession of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he, he, the, he, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. I mean, I don't know how you unseal something like that. You know, we're indwelt. How do you outdwelt the Holy Spirit? I'll just say, for me, and I'm not, and I'm, just, I'm not, this is a great, different positions in the church, we're all saved, going to heaven, and that's when we'll know. But I just say, it's just been awesome. I see how God is working, especially in these verses in Ephesians. It's a complete unity of process to, to glory, eternal life. And I just, I just think, you know, we, we get confused by people, I think, that make a profession, and then their life goes bananas. I'll tell you what, until they take their last breath, there's opportunity for them to be restored to where they were. Not like I say, you know, don't keep praying for your prodigals. They're just working on their testimony. You know, that's my hope. It's my hope that they're going to come back to the Lord. So I don't know. To me, I just see such a, a completeness here. God sealed me. I'm His. I belong to God. I've got the seal of God on my life. His indwelling Holy Spirit. He's given me. You know, it's God's seal of ownership, basically. And note that at what point though were we sealed with the Holy Spirit before we believe? No, before the foundations of the earth. Sort of, but not, not how it's described here. No, we're, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit when we heard the word of truth of the gospel and what? Yeah. Believed. Believed. That's the moment of the Holy Spirit rushing into us, right? And we're sealed. The moment we believed in Christ. And so what's the significance of this idea? And by the way, sealing. Another picture. I mean, they always seal letters. You know, you'd have a signet ring of some sort. That's what a signet means, signet ring. And you drip wax on the back of a letter or a scroll or whatever, and you press your ring, and that was the only one in existence, and that proved that the owner of the ring had sealed that. Um, <clears throat> merchants would seal a shipment, okay? They would seal it to say that when it left our port, everything on the manifest was in it, okay? Anything that's not, well, you better check and see if that seal got busted, okay? Because it was all there, so um, uh, it, 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 but it had it had other significance. So I'm saying they knew about this idea of sealing, but it speaks of a finished transaction. Same today, aren't, aren't there lots of documents you do that it needs it has a seal on it? I mean, government things and things like that. That that's that, that signifies that the transaction is complete. The sealing implies ownership. God has put a seal on us because He's purchased us to be His own, and so in a way, we're sealed uh, by the Lord. It means security and protection. The believer belongs to God. We're, we're safe. We're protected because we're part of his finished transaction of eternal life. And fourth, it's a mark of authenticity. Just as a signature on a letter attests to the genuineness of the document, so the presence of the Spirit proves the salvation of the believer, doesn't it? Romans 8, 9 says this, Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Thus, thus you know, and then there's scriptures that, you know, thus we're, 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 we, we look for evidences of the Holy Spirit in our believer's life. And we have many passages that suggest to us the full range of things that, that happen when we change families. When we go from Adam's family to Christ's family, there should be changes in our family trait, right, in, in what we do. And so that's why we look. There's no joy in sin sniffing or pointing or whatever. But, you know, when we're talking to somebody or maybe we're talking to our own children or something, you know, we want to be looking for the evidence, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in you. Ephesians 2.10 2 says that before time, God gave, you know, God gave us works to do after we're saved. You know, are we, are we doing anything for the kingdom of God? That's sort of an evidence of the Holy Spirit pointing us. And, uh, I could go on and on on that, but you get the idea. Verse 14, our last verse. So this Holy Spirit is also the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. 
So he's talking about a guarantee. You can understand guarantee is what we call uh, today actually the meaning, and that meant more like earnest money. I think I think the old King James says earnest. Actually, says earnest. Um, the idea of earnest money. I know when I you know I bought my first house, they wanted some earnest money. No, no, no. I'm really going to buy it. Yeah, sure. Earnest money right now. Okay, <laughs> or I'm selling it to the next person. Um, uh, so, so it's the proof of intent to complete a sales transaction. Maybe it's a car, a boat, a house. But someone comes to you, hey, this is the done deal. I want this, but I can't complete the transaction. Okay, at this moment. So here's my earnest money, my down payment, until I get back to you the full amount. So, in, in, in spiritually speaking, the Holy Spirit is God's um, earnest money that he's going to finish the job. Okay, this is where you are now, but I'm taking you to eternity. I'm taking, you're going to live to see Revelation 21. The new Jerusalem, uh, the, the, the tree of life spanning that river. You're going to see the new Jerusalem drop out of the sky. You're going to have an address in that thing. Okay, God and Christ are going to live there, be the, be the light. There'll be no sun or moon anymore because we're going to be living in the very presence of God and Christ, the Lamb. He's going to finish the transaction. Holy Spirit is our earnest money. God's saying, you're guaranteed. Take it to the bank. You're going to make it there. I'm going to, I'm going to take you to where I promised I would take you. It's a done deal. So I think that's it. Um, Dave, if you guys want to come back up, I think we'll just start our wrap up here, folks. So, wow, what a, what a few, what a powerful few verses of under, how, what a great letter to a Gentile city with a new church trying to explain to them what does it mean to say Christ is my Lord and Savior? What is happening? Uh, where many of them, their whole understanding is coming from pagan religion. How awesome that God does these things. He makes his decisions before all time, and you can just count on them. Yeah. How different from worshiping Zeus and Jupiter and Artemis and all of that, they were just known as capricious and, and they're, they're making, a, you know, they're fighting with each other and they're changing their minds and they're, you know, to, to come to a place where we have one God and anything he says, it's a done deal. You can, you can live your life depending on it. What a, oh, how nice that had to be and, and what great pictures he's using to help draw them to that understanding. Just look at these words we have. I mean, we're blessed with every spiritual blessing. He chose us or elected us to be holy and blameless before the foundation of the earth. In love, he predestined us for adoption. In him, we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of our trespasses, and his grace is lavished upon us. Wow. And in him, we've obtained an inheritance. <coughs> We're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is our guarantee that our inheritance will, will come to pass. We will come to own it one day. Can't miss. So anyway, we've been chosen to showcase God's grace. You know, I, we, we should be rather amazed when we share what, what it's been like to come, come to Jesus Christ. You know, um, uh, Jesus turned the world upside down just with simple people. You know, he, he used, I mean, he used Paul a lot, but there aren't many Pauls after Paul. Just used a lot of common people that were just amazed by the, the beauty and grace of God. So, man, we just, we've learned a lot about who we are, you know. And here's the other thing about this assurance. We don't have to be taking our spiritual temperature every five minutes. Listen, there's going to be ups and there's going to be downs. God obviously knew that from before all time, right? And so what we have to understand is that we're sealed. We're, we're, we're adopted, can't be unadopted. We're in that family. We're, we have an inheritance in our name, and it's assured to us as long as we don't lose sight of one thing, and that's that Jesus is our Lord. And we understand that what he did on the cross is what saves us. And I talked last week about this idea that life is sort of like an ocean liner crossing the ocean, right? And uh, we're on that boat. And, you know, you, Queen Mary's have you know eight or ten thousand people on it. Um, the idea is God's God's perfect will is that boat's going from London to New York City. Now you're going to be on that boat for some number of weeks, and you're going to have total free will. Do whatever you want. Make every decision you want. You can jump off if you want. You can stay on. You can make friends. You can make enemies. You can you can be drunk the whole time. Whatever. But that boat, is, God's determined, it's going from. Doesn't matter what decisions you make. 
folks going to New York City. Don't give me any iceberg stories. That's not part of this analogy, okay? <laughs> boat. That was the boat of man's will, okay? But God's will is gonna, it's gonna dock in New York. And all I want to say, you have you have the ability to to live live a life and you're given great guides, but just don't jump ship. Don't jump ship because God is promising you you're gonna step off at the other end. You're gonna stand in the promised land. Promises us that he guarantees us. Amen? Amen. 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 What a good word. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord.